incredible venue. I was just walking by and I thought, what the hell is this? This is like, because I was told there were no containers at all and they brought it all in and all this lightning and I'm so impressed. It's unbelievable. It's just totally amazing. And I met some of you and I would love to meet uh, more later. But I'm so impressed and like totally hyped, totally hyped. Okay, I should get started. So, uh, welcome, hello, and I'm really, really happy to be here back in Stockholm. And uh, this is a session about personality and I do have a warning for you just in case. Uh, we don't take any liability for what's going to happen next. You're going to see some examples that, that might have a profound impact on your life or your career or your design choices later. And I'm not responsible for whatever happens next. And I'm not joking. Um, now, when we actually speak about things, oh, this is the wrong one. Uh, when we actually speak about things on the web today, very often we tend to be a little bit sad, maybe. Maybe it's just me, but I really miss Flash. Anybody misses Flash? My Flash people, my Flash people. Not the technology though. No, not the technology. I miss this crazy creativity where you end up on the site and you have no idea what to do and you click on buttons and something happens and you never expected this to happen, but it happens. How often does it happen today? You click on a button and something unusual happens. That's so rare. That's so rare. I would love to see a little bit more unexpected or unexpected. So I was looking into options of how to make it a bit possible. So, my name is Vitaly, and today I want to cover some of the things that I discovered. And I've really been around in this industry for quite some time, but also, most importantly, I co-founded this magazine, which turned out to be red. And it's very important that it's red, because there is a story behind it that I might get into later. But as we were redesigning, kind of moving from the previous design to this design, with cats, and I don't like cats, with cats, uh, we ended up learning a lot along the way. So I want to share a couple of things. And most importantly, there is also a button here where you can turn off the redness if you want to. Just saying, because I get these emails every single day. Now, beyond that, I really started thinking, when we worked on a redesign, right? Uh, we had some re reasons why we wanted to do a redesign in the first place, but most importantly, really started thinking about how do we bring some sort of personality on the web? How do we make things a bit more memorable? How do we make things a bit more interesting, a bit more exciting as well? And I think that when I started to kind of dig deeper and understand why is it that everything looks exactly the same everywhere, it kind of reflects the process that we're following. Right? If you think about the way we're designing or building, you know, any kind of creative process always follows this schema where the design process is weird and complicated because it involves people and systems and organizations which often are weird and complicated. Right? And so this is also a common way of how we or our managers tend to see a creative process. Right? You start somewhere and you have this big grandiose idea and you start evolving it and you start refining it and you start improving it and at some point as you keep moving from one place to another you end up at some point hitting that finish line. Right? But the reality looks sometimes a little bit different. Right? Because this is at least what the creative process looks like to me. You start somewhere and go. You explore, you diverge, you try to figure out what would work best. And every now and again, you will hit this dead end where you have to recover from it. And recovering from this dead end, moving on to something better or more interesting, takes time. And we never have the pleasure or luxury of time. We're always running behind the schedule. So we end up kind of relying on things that used to work in the past. Many of you might have seen this um, tweet a while back. Which of these two websites are you designing today? The one on the left or the one on the right? right? Which one are you designing today? Because the only difference between them is the position of the carousel. Because sometimes you'll find the carousel at the bottom, sometimes at the top, and sometimes both at the top and at the bottom, because why not? Right? But is it really everything we can do as designers, just moving these boxes in a very predictable way? Well, we've been doing it for many, 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 many years. If we look at the iterations that happened with Adobe Photoshop's toolbar over the last 30 years, free zero, 30 years, you know, not much has changed from 1987 until today, right? But maybe at some point, somebody would, it would be useful if somebody sat down and figured out a very different way how to approach something like a Photoshop toolbar. Because we keep improving and refining on this macro level all the time, be staying kind of and being stuck on this local maximum. Doing kind of the same, the same, just a little bit better every now and again, but staying in this local maximum. And I wanted to move out from that and break out from that and try to explore what would be the global maximum you could explore. 
We tend to get lost in those A-B tests, and what we tend to do most of the time is explore A-B tests, but also A-Z tests, where you would test two very different design approaches that have nothing to do with each other, while also kind of looking into the way of how we can refine buttons with A-B testing. And we see many companies kind of really taking it to the heart. These are the changes that are happening on you know, Facebook and Twitter and all these applications every single day, a little bit one by one, one pixel to the left, one pixel to the right, right? And these are the changes that are happening in Facebook bottom navigation over the course or span of one day. Just one day. One pixel to the left, one pixel to the right. How many of you had discussions with your developers or your colleagues, border radius? 14 pixels or 16 pixels? Just to move back, maybe like two months later, to 13 pixels, right? And I'm wondering, does it really matter? It probably does in some way, but maybe we just tend to overestimate the importance of it. And I was attending this session by Morgan Smuller, who's a Danish designer, a while back. And he said a couple of things which really stuck with me. If you want to stand out today, we need to delight the customers with a remarkable design and a mindful, uh, unique, charming personality, using some sort of unprecedented attention to detail. And that's, of course, true. But at the same time, this is not enough. We know how to stand out if we're given the resources and the time to stand out, but we never have the privilege to do that. So if you want to make a kind of think of a memorable site, that you may be a website that you stumbled upon recently, and you still remember today, there wouldn't be that many websites like that. This is one of them which really stuck with me for quite some time. And when I see it, I almost feel how much time, effort, people, resources, money, and everything had to be brought in to make this website happen. It has to be performant, it has to be accessible, it has to be fast, it has to be readable, and all those things, which kind of just became the part of our job as a result, right? This is an incredibly massive effort. We know how to do things well, just we don't have the time to do that. Here's another one, which is SBS, um, the boat, That's which, which is an interactive storytelling, where they kind of highlight a story in a kind of a, an interactive comic book-alike experience, and has audio and video, and it's really beautiful, and it just keeps strolling. The story unfolds itself about the boat floating, Right? And then you have this really nice combination of the visual and the audio and this position and the layout and the placement of things. Things are shaking and it's really immersive. We can do that. This is not that complicated. But how do we make it on a slightly smaller scale where everybody could afford doing things like that? And I think it has to deal with the fact that it's really hard to tell a story. So when I look at Uber, for example, I don't see a lot of storytelling that really captures my attention. And I ask myself, how come is that if there was a service in my country or in my place where I live, which was maybe like 10 cents cheaper than an Uber, I would switch right away. I don't have any loyalty to Uber at all. It's cheaper, I'm switching, right? But why is it that it takes me so much effort to move away from MailChimp? Right? Why am I so happy to pay the money, although MailChimp is not necessarily a very you know, cheap service? And I don't think it's just a monkey. I, I mean, I like Freddy, but it's not just a monkey. I think it's, it goes much deeper, because the product is really represented by the people. And the people have really high values, that I, at least the people that I know of. So some of the things that they're producing are these wonderful, beautiful things, like a color books for children to paint over. And they're just distributed to, for free to everybody on the streets. There is no button saying that MailChimp is the best company in the world, right? It's just so friendly, so humane, so authentic in many ways. And of course it's marketing, but it's a good kind of marketing. Like, hi, I'm Freddy. It's fun to be me. Is it fun to be you? How can you answer it in a negative way? Like, I'm no fun at all. I'm the most boring person alive. <laughs> well, of course not. And then it keeps going and going and going, and it's really, really nice. And then even things like this. I love being me. Do you love being you? I hate myself every day I wake up, right? Nobody will ever say that. And I think just because they produce this kind of copywriting and copy that really captures this emotional connection, creates this emotional connection, this is why I stuck with them, and probably also because of this. That feeling when you're just about to send a campaign to 200,000 people, this animation alone captures this emotion in such a profound way, it really connects with us. So I started thinking, how can I produce more products that are more like MailChimp and a bit less like Uber? And I started thinking a lot about what does it even mean, right? 
if everything is obvious and everything is kind of you know, clear, you click on the button and something happens, and it's exactly what's happening when you click on that button, then it's not really exciting, and you don't really capture that emotional connection between the people and the interface. So I thought maybe we could introduce some friction. For a long time, we've been saying that we should not make people think, but if we don't make people think, we're losing an opportunity to connect with them in the first place. And I'm not talking about making people think like this. This is not very helpful, right? This is not particularly the experience that you might want to have. Uh, or even this one, um, because this is what we get used to over the years, right? You go to a site to maybe buy c cinema tickets, and you're greeted with a wonderful pop-up, and then you click on the close button because the video doesn't play, whatever that happens there. And what happens, of course, is you know, that thing opens in a new tab. Now, that's friction. That's not the kind of friction I'm talking about. And then, actually, you click once more, and then, of course, it opens in a new tab one more time. Isn't that nice? And then, if you do decide to buy, to get that ticket, this is a wonderful interface that you present it with. <laughs> you know, there's just one button, but you have to read all of that, right? Now, even better, things are getting more and more interesting. Imagine you want to buy a boat. You know, somebody, you know, some of us might want to buy a boat at some point, so you go to this page. It's a beautiful, beautiful page. And then you end up thinking, you know, this is the day. That's the day I'm going to buy a boat. So you go and click on Build My Sessa, which is one of the boats that they provide. You choose a module to configure. This is how it usually works. Right? And what you're presented with while you're about to buy something for maybe $1 million right, is this. Half a carousel. They don't give you a full carousel, just half of it. Right? <laughs> Two hamburger icons on top for the price of one, right? which is a little bit confusing, to say the least. Right? And then you think, uh, OK, I, I got that. I got that. I got that. I got that. There is a height summary thing here. Let's click that. Yes, and then it disappears, but then it appears again, right? And you're about to pay somebody $1 million, right? This is not the kind of friction. Or oh, the last one, I have to show it, you know? This is an insurance uh, policy form, which you have to sign up for. Uh, and they have a couple of questions that they're asking. Namely, one of them is, do you have children? And they're using a slider for this. And I think that at some point, somebody must be sitting in front of a fancy machine, you know, with Sketch or Photoshop or Indus or anything, right? Thinking, do you have children, huh? <laughs> slider. It has to be a slider, right? And then the best thing about the slider, it has a minimum value and the maximum value. And the minimum value is zero, but the maximum value has to be defined. And luckily, it is defined by developers because it's five. But if you happen to have six, there is a way out because you can click on the pencil icon. And then the input field shows up, and then you can say, I have you know, as many as you like. But then it will tell you, ah, 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 five, <laughs> because the interface knows better. right? And so this is not quite the interface I'm looking at. But I was thinking, why? If we look in Tijuana Flats, which is the chain of Mexican restaurants in the US, this is what they look like inside. Right? This is a really traditional, not traditional, but like zombie-like kind of thing going on. And there is a lot of storytelling going on. Right? And if we look at the people attending or visiting the restaurant, we'll find out these people are really small and these walls are really tall. Right? So every couple of months, they hire professional graffiti artists to come and unfold that story, to share the personality. Right? And of course, the menu has to kind of reflect that personality, and it does. Whether you like it or not, it's not the point. Um, at the same time, the website has to reflect the personality as well. So meet the wonderful website. How often do you see that on the web today? Right? You might hate it, you might like it, that's not the point. But the issue is, well, it actually does you know, have this personality, which is totally missing in many websites that we have out there, and have no idea what's expecting you. There's a lot of visual stuff going on, right? and it's really quite heavy. But in the spirit of everything we know about web today, in the spirit of things like textures are expensive, web fonts are expensive, and all those things, they decided to move away from this design to this design. And I think that there is a lot of personality lost between the previous design and this design. I'm totally running out of time here. Just saying, just saying. I'll get my time. Um, and no company knows it better than Blomberg, right? Creating websites like this. Who likes it? Who hates it? That's probably the weirdest question you could ask, because what does it mean? A design is supposed to serve a surface. 
right? It's supposed to serve a purpose. It doesn't belong in museums anywhere, right? So, of course, this design is brilliant because it helped sell all the tickets two months earlier than the year before. So it served its purpose, so of course it's pretty in design. It's provoking, it definitely is. It's confusing maybe in some ways, it is, but it helps serve the purpose, right? And in many ways, they keep producing things like this, where they hired a bunch of designers who are given the freedom to do whatever they wanted, <laughs> and they decided to do whatever they wanted, right? Creating these really memorable experiences that actually brought them a lot of traffic, and all of a sudden, Blumberg, that was seen as a quite boring company compared to CNBC and all the others, was seen as a design company, right? Because they are trying and experimenting and doing all kinds of crazy design experiments, mostly just for the sake of it. And this is, again, where frictions come into place. But again, of course we don't want to see all of that happening everywhere on the web, but this brings you attention. Because when everything is the same, this brings your attention. And many companies are trying to do something along those lines, including Dropbox. They did this huge, big rebranding, which was really strange for many people, but it actually did the job well. So how can we make, introduce some friction without actually breaking the web? Well, you can be a little bit different, just showing your personality along the way. It's very hard to point out what's so weird or strange or different about the site. Maybe it's a pointer, maybe it's a couple of um, like buttons and the way they look like, but everything is just a little bit different, trying to you know, show the personality, just the way they position the buttons, the position they change the cursor and things like that. Just one thing, not much. That's sometimes it's even enough to be a little bit different, the layout and things like that. Here's another one, again, this marquee, right, and this huge menu button with a really huge menu kind of show up, shows up, and all this kind of really strange layout. You can do that, it's still readable. And we like the fact that everything has to be the same, but it doesn't. When I was running some usability tests on this one, this is Francais de la Motte, right? I thought, this is crazy. This is probably so annoying for so many people, they must just hate it. And I was running this test, people loved it. Because the buttons are very clickable, the menu is huge, it's really impossible to miss, right? You show navigation, of course, and people really felt like it's great. They can read everything. It's not too big. It's just fine, right? And we tend to hide navigation as well, right? We feel like navigation has to live behind the hamburger icon. This is it. This is where it belongs. But sometimes it might be perfectly fine to actually embed navigation as well as a part of your story if it fits in, right? Adding a little bit of you know, different friction to make things a little bit more exciting. But that's not enough because we need to bring it and tame it somehow. And so this is where you can just take something that might be a little bit boring at first and make it a bit more interesting. Hans Brinker is a hotel in Amsterdam. Now, it's not a good hotel. If you're not a good hotel, you should not be expecting five-star reviews on TripAdvisor. They're lucky if they get three-star reviews on TripAdvisor. They were having problems because they were not booking enough rooms. So what did they end up doing? Well, they decided, okay, so what do we do? I mean, we cannot just close it. We need to do something. Let's maybe do a redesign. And they came to a designer, and the designer was told that they don't have the budget to do a Big Bang redesign. So the designer said, well, can we invest some money? And they said, no. And the designer said, well, so you're saying we can't make it better? No. So let's make it worse. Right? <laughs> if we can't make it better, let's make it worse. What if we try to sell the worst hotel experience in the world? Even if you don't have a story to tell, you can just invent a story to tell. And so the photography and the layout and the typography has to reflect how bad the hotel is, obviously, right? So they will be creating lots of things like this, which would really try to explain how horrible the hotel really is. And guess what? They're expanding to Lisbon now because they're fully booked, right? Everyone wants to see and to experience the worst experience in the world. The same way, like the like button, right? They really want to be liked. If you want to be liked, just make it very clear that you want to be liked. Right? And so they even fired, hired a professional photographer who was asked to not do professional photos because it would be too professional. Right? What about pop-ups? Anybody likes pop-ups? I love pop-ups, if, if they fit. I'm a really strange character. So this is the best pop-up in the world. I wish every single website had a pop-up like this at some point. This is incredible. Right? It's extremely frustrating and annoying and it's difficult to close. Right? But it really fits in within the story. So even those pop-ups that usually look extremely horrible and annoying and all of that, they can, you know, if they fit within the story, that's just fine. Right? Or these H-prompts. What could be more boring in the world than an H-prompt? 
You want to get a gift for somebody to buy a bottle of whiskey or scotch or so, and hey, how old are you? Well, that's not friendly. And many websites don't really care, so you can type in 32nd day of 43rd month of 1547, and you're still enter the, entering the site because they don't really care. If you want to lie, just go ahead and lie, right? But you can take it, and all of those examples are actually really easy to do. It's not like it requires a significant effort like the examples I showed earlier, right? You can just say, let's make it a bit more interesting. Austin Beer Works, are you 21 or not? If you click yes, you enter the site and you're done. And if not, hmm, let's talk, right? <laughs> now, are you at least 18? Hmm, <laughs> 17? Hmm, maybe you are 16, at least 16. Right? And just keeps going, and it doesn't matter what you, depending on what you're answering, right? It will show you one thing or the other, so it becomes a choose your own adventure kind of thing, right? And there is no way to close it anymore <laughs> at this point, right? And then you just have to go through with it, and then as you do, eventually you're landing on this page, which is kind of a video, uh, which essentially is <laughs> explaining that they don't like you that much. And you're laughing, but this is exactly the emotional connection that I'm talking about. It's not difficult to produce. That's not expensive to produce. Everybody can do this, right? We don't need an you know, incredible team, huge team of people working on things like that. You take something that's very boring, you make it a bit more interesting. What is more boring than the title? Title, Mr., Miss, Mrs., stuff like that. You don't have to have five options. If you really need this information, go overboard. <laughs> Who would you like to be today? Imagine you're getting a package from somewhere, and it says, hey, Princess Leah, so here's a little package delivery for you. That's incredible, that's great. And it's a huge list, it's more than 55 options, <laughs> right? This is really, really huge. So you take, again, it's not difficult to produce, it's just a couple of elements that you add in, right? <sighs> yeah, we can do make things a bit more interesting. Oh, here, here's another one. You might have seen this, of course, before. When, you know, when you start typing, and then this character replying to what you're typing, and, you know, we tend to think about don't make people think. But I wanted to type, and type again, and retype, and delete typing, and type all over, and type again, just to see if that character is going to change somehow. And the same goes for the password, and things like that. <laughs> and it's really, really nice, right? And you can even do more. Like, you can make people wait. Just make people wait, that's okay. Not too long, but I wait a little. That's nothing, not too bad. Or here's one. You know, somebody's, you know, this email newsletter box in the checkout, yes, I want to opt in or I want to opt out, like the radio button. Can you make a radio button more interesting? Of course you can. <laughs> right? You can say, well, why don't you click twice or three times? If you really want that email, you will click a couple of times, right? And so you end up kind of having this little game almost with this character, and the more you click and the more annoying it becomes, right? They can go ahead and do all kinds of things, including things like that, right? But it's not enough. So we can, of course, do introduce a little bit of friction. We can introduce kind of this a little bit of fun stuff every now and again. But it's not enough if you want to stand out. Because what you want to stand out, it's not enough to have something like custom illustrations. So if we look at uh, Atlassian, and we look at Intercom, and we look at Slack, and we look at Oscar, for example, they use all of them use custom, animation, custom illustrations and they're all a bit different, but they're using still the same color scheme, making them look pretty much the same, right? Um, so what do you do there? Well, you need a signature, a little signature that you're using consistently everywhere. It could be something like maybe a glitch effect, something of this kind, where every now and again you introduce this kind of glitchy thing and you use it consistently across all the different pages, right? You can use something like that, maybe. Um, here we have another thing where you have this little uh, pencil scribble, right? That's also used consistently across an entire page. Nothing, nobody else has it, right? So you are kind of can stand out by doing something of this kind instead of doing something that every, looks like exactly like everything else, right? Or maybe even, you know, like Medium, where they introduce this collage type of art, which they use sparingly, but every now and again to highlight uh, the different parts of the site. So as you move around, you find these collages kind of used pretty much consistently as well. Or maybe here, kind of a couple of 3D boxes, which are also used consistently all over the page. So you need to define your visual style, right? And so that means kind of finding that signature that really will define you. In our case, in Smashing's case, it's the cats, 
Nobody else has the cat, so this is our signature. And also the tilting, which is our second signature, right? So you really have to find it, and you can find it only by experimenting with your style. I mean, you could, of course, go ahead and do something like this. Anybody familiar with video text? Oh, fans of video text here, right? Um, well, you can say, essentially, video text is just like the web. Oh, the web is like video text, because you just tap on things, the numbers at this point, and you move from one place to another. It's like links, so you can provide a similar experience. This could be your signature, maybe a little bit too much, though. And even in corporate settings, you can introduce some sort of signature, like here. The only thing that's different about this particular site, which sells wheels, right, is the fact that everything is a little bit cut off and tilted, like the wheels are as well. So you go to the product page, everything is a little bit tilted, and that's enough to give them a little bit of a personality. So I'm not talking about some sort of a fun project alone. They can benefit from it. Right? And sometimes, of course, it could be some sort of animation or the lack animation of animation. Or maybe things like this where things are transitioning. So as you're refreshing the page, right, things are kind of showing up slowly. And then as you move from one page to another, there is a little bit of a delay. This little animation, which is maybe two seconds long or so, it's enough to actually make the site stand out a little bit more, right? which is very cool. And then finally, you also need to really bring focus to all of that. Because it's not enough to be playing with the visual. You really have to solve an actual problem. And so very often when we think about improving things, we tend to think about the predictable things. right? Uh, we tend to think about things like, oh, I just have to jump a little bit. Oh, I'm just going to the wrong direction here. Uh, we tend to think about things like, let's just have a date picker and make it a little bit nicer. Here's a date picker. Do you like it or do you hate it? And do you understand how it works? So this is a date picker constructor, if you like, where you construct your date, literally. Who thinks that this is a great design? Who thinks it's a bad design? It's a really tricky question. You're not supposed to answer it at all. Because whenever you ask it, it depends on the purpose. If you put it on some sort of an airline website, it will not work. But if you put it in a place which it was designed for, it works great. It was designed for a public library where people tend to index books. So typing in the data, the date of a book when it was published, is much slower on a regular keyboard. So instead, if it works on a dashboard, and these buttons are big enough, it's much faster to type this actual value than it would be on a keyboard. So of course it's wonderful design because it serves this purpose, right? Now oh, here's another example. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. On YouTube, a very common thing that shows up as a problem is whenever you have a lengthy video or lecture documentary and somebody calls you, jumping back and forward by 10 seconds is really, really difficult. So what can you do with that? Well, maybe you could change the scale dynamically. So on YouTube, you can tap and hover up, and then the scale changes. So you can even jump two seconds forward or two seconds back really easily. That's quite remarkable. And you can do it with pretty much any kind of video player. That actually solves a real problem. One of my favorite examples is coming from SBB Mobile, where when you want to book a ticket to go from one destination to another, uh, one location to another destination, right? on SBB Mobile, which is a railway ticketing system in Switzerland, you just draw a line. Just draw a line, that's it. This is the way to book a ticket. No input of where I am and where you're going, you just draw a line. That's your input, right? So this, all of these examples really show the actual problems solved. And they have this introduced this notion of touch timetable. We can move things around and define some settings. And this is really interesting, and this is what keeps people kind of sticky and stay with you on the site. Right? And this is why when we started working on Smashing, just a couple more examples and then I'm done, um, we actually started very early on defining that language. So this was one of the first things that we designed. Right? So there is a panel, so you read an article and there is this panel. And on this panel, you see a couple, some text and then the button. And the button says this button does nothing. Who would click this button? Oh, you are not alone. You're not alone. Everybody loves this button, right? So we started looking into how can we define personality through microcopy and through the visuals. The visuals were kind of clear, the cats. But we started looking into microcopy way before we started working on the entire interface design, kind of bringing all the things that I mentioned earlier into the interface, right? Or even things like this in the checkout, really introducing literally friction at the point where it should not be, right? Namely, this wonderful checkbox. My favorite checkbox of all, 
right? And people love clicking on it. They really do, right? And it's not like it increases conversion or decreases conversion. It does, it's not the point. But this is really the point where people kind of, they're confronted with our personality, whether they want it or not. And I would rather be liked or hated than just be not important at all. Right? So I think that this is a really important thing that we learned, at least, in our, uh, when we started working on it. And the same goes also for error messages, which were all designed early on before we started working on things. And it's totally useless outside of the context of the page or the site, but it kind of fits in because it was the starting point for us. And then only later, we started working on the typefaces and the visual design and all of that. Right? And don't get me started about the cats. We can talk about the cats later. That's not so important. So there are many things along the way like that. And all those things that I mentioned, adding a little bit of friction, finding something that's really boring, making it a bit more interesting, finding your signature, something that really defines you and nobody else has, right? And a little bit of experimentation every now and again, it would bring you to a really good place. So I want to wrap up at this point. Yeah, I'm supposed to wrap up. I'm just totally over time here. Uh, I want to wrap up by showing just a few, two videos, uh, which I think are really important. We're living in a world where everything looks a little bit similar and everything is trying to solve the ultimate problem in the world, but at the same time, there are really literally bigger problems that need solving. And so I would love to see more applications like this showing up everywhere and used everywhere compared to what we tend to design most you of the time. You might wonder how blind people deal with everyday challenges. Well, normally the answer is simple. We're not that different from you. We play music. We go to school. We go to work. You get the picture. But sometimes the simplest things can be difficult and we need a pair of eyes. Connect to. That's where you come in. Through your smartphone, Be My Eyes connects the blind with sighted people through a live video connection. Simply choose if you need help or want to help by the click of a button. That's a nice picture of you and your family, Caroline. Is this for a present? <laughs> yes, it's a photo from my parents. You can help just by installing the Be My Eyes app. Image. And we'll notify you when someone needs your help. And if you're in the middle of something, don't worry. Someone else will step in. So, would you care to be my eyes? So, you know, when I look at it, and I think about all the decisions we make every day, it doesn't matter what, bar, what border radius we have on the button. It doesn't even matter what color this button has. It has to be a big button that's accessible, that's all. Right? As long as there is an idea, this is the only thing that matters. It's a little bit sad, so I'm going to show you another video, which is the story of my life in 40 seconds, and then I'm really finished, I promise. <laughs> uh, which is a very s strong story, because it doesn't matter what you do, you will never get things right. And this is really great. I used to be a perfectionist for many years, and then I gave it up was the best decision I did in my entire life. I'm so happy, so much happier now. Because the world is imperfect and so are we. And that's okay, maybe we just need to embrace it. So welcome to my and probably your world. designers oh it's sad as well well thanks to Pearl Studio for the video 
And although it's a bit sad, I do have cats and more cats and a little summary. But it's, uh, and now and thank you.